Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Lost Highway. This film came out in 1997 and it was directed by David Lynch. This movie is kind of unique because it, to me it feels like a, a transitional film for David Lynch. He's wanting to show movies that are more self-aware, much more self-aware of the cinematic language and, you know, of course the cinematic tropes and how they relate to uh, dreams and the, the unconscious mind. He's a big fan of using classic cinematic tropes that are combined with a sort of surrealism to reveal our most innate desires. And he certainly touched on those aspects earlier on in his career in, I think, more of an accessible way when you look at something like Blue Velvet, of course, or uh, Twin Peaks. And I think beyond Twin Peaks, the 1990s were kind of a, a maybe a rougher time for David Lynch in terms of trying to find that style, just because this movie, I don't feel like he quite has his footing yet in that world. It feels to me more like a... Uh, like a rough draft of a movie like Mulholland Drive, which in my opinion is kind of like the fully realized version of what he's going for. Here he's kind of plunging himself all the way into this more abstract style of filmmaking. And while it doesn't resonate with me on the level of a movie like Blue Velvet, which I find to be kind of a near perfect film, and then of course Mulholland Drive, which is I think David Lynch's magnum opus, it is still intriguing and there's a lot about it that you can pick apart and it, it's, these kinds of movies are so open to interpretation, and I really love that. Those are my favorite kinds of films. Now, honestly, to me, it's it's crazy to think just how similar these two movies are, Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway. So many of the themes are similar. The structure is nearly the same in a lot of ways. If you've seen one before seeing the other, I think that it's helpful. It helps you kind of understand things a bit better as a whole, just in terms of his whole um, filmography. But the uncanny similarities, you know, like the, the flashing blue lights, of course, which are kind of like a signal between transitioning from reality to fantasy or vice versa. Classic David Lynch symbols like the smoke, the uh, red curtains, of course the, the femme fatale doppelganger. All of these things serve a similar purpose in other David Lynch films, but of course in particular Mulholland Drive. But where this film differs from, from Mulholland Drive in a, in a really interesting way is, is the protagonist. Obviously the protagonist in Mahon Drive is the Naomi Watts character, Betty slash Diane, and here we have the character of Fred. So obviously it's a, a male protagonist. Seeing it from a male's point of view is, is a lot different. And these characters are very similar in the sense that they're both wanting to escape their realities and they feel a sense of inadequacy in their love lives. But I think here the, the big distinction is kind of the masculinity complex. That's, that's a huge one. To me that changes things significantly and that's what differentiates the two in a really compelling way. It is that feeling of inadequacy. He feels like he can't really please the woman that he loves, his wife, in the way that she she needs for him to. And that's very, very frustrating for him. His wife here is played by Patricia Arquette, and she's she's got a very icy quality to her. There's there's a distance, a disconnect between the two of them. She's the, the classic temptress or the femme fatale um, stereotype. A woman who's very alluring and mysterious, but ultimately you know that she's going to betray the protagonist. Between the Fred character and his wife, the, the, the sex scenes are, are what's most fascinating to me because it's very clear that there's just a block. Uh, the two are just on, on different wavelengths. He's really, as I said before, trying to satisfy her, please her, and she doesn't really feel that. There's almost like a condescension in, in the way that she approaches him, and that just frustrates him, and that is one of the big reasons why he, he feels the need to escape his reality, I think. Fred wants to be somebody else, and he wants something that's ultimately unattainable. And in fantasy, a lot of that represents the, the unattainable. And just like in Mulholland Drive, you've got a character who is creating kind of fantasy characters and, and fantasy worlds because they can't cope with the world that they currently live in. Trying to achieve the unattainable is a constant battle within all people, which is why we can relate to Lynch films so well, I think. And I think that he, that's one of the things that David Lynch likes to explore perhaps the most. Film is a very integral part of society, and it has been obviously since the beginning of the 20th century. And, but it can also be very dangerous, and I've said that a lot, you know, that once it is romanticized, what we see on the screen, it becomes uh, kind of a way to brainwash us. It's, it's a way for us to all of a sudden want to live our lives in a different way, in a less realistic way. We start wanting our lives to have that, that, that neat and tidy structure that we see in film, and in a lot of ways it kind of creates our own happiness because we don't have finite conclusions and, and endings like in, in movies. And it's that frustration that causes people like David Lynch probably to want to deconstruct all of that and figure out why we feel these things. He's exploring more of the, the Freudian themes and, and the sexual desires 
that are embedded within our minds so deeply. And I think that's what separates Lynch from a lot of other Hollywood filmmakers, is just his fearlessness as he delves into all of these themes, as he delves so readily into the deconstruction of, of cinema, trying to understand how film manipulates us and how that can also be quite toxic to us in ways that we don't really understand. In Lost Highway, he's wanting to explore how escapism distorts our expectations of reality. And he does this by um, exploring truth versus memory. The whole truth versus memory argument is one that a lot of people have had. And in this movie, there's a key line where the Bill Pullman character, Fred, says that he doesn't like video cameras because he prefers to remember things how he remembers them and not how they necessarily happened. And I mean, that in a nutshell is what, what film does too. It, it, it manipulates us. We would rather remember things with um, kind of that emotional distortion because it gives us a sort of sensation. It's, it's visceral. It feels more meaningful to us. And that is what the second half of the movie represents to me is your, the first half obviously is, is Fred's story and then it transitions into this completely different one that is um, supposedly fictional and that's the, the Pete storyline. I mean, he's like the younger person that Fred I guess sort of wishes that he was. Fred has gone just really deep into this psychoanalytic abyss and um, Pete comes out the other side and even though Pete is this young guy and he kind of represents a sort of um, a character that you might have seen in a film from, from the golden age of Hollywood, uh, that is, I guess, sort of what Fred wishes he could be. It's, it's his way of escaping. But even in that sense, uh, the Pete character is not doing so well. So a lot of what um, Fred wishes and what he romanticizes about Pete starts to dissolve little by little. And a lot of that insecurity and that pain from Fred's real life is starting to creep into the fantasy. And that to me is maybe one of the more compelling ideas in this film, the idea that even in fantasy, even in these narratives where everything is supposed to be romanticized to such a degree, um, a bit of real life always bleeds into it. It's a sort of unconscious thing that we don't really have much control over. And Pete, as a character, you know, he's just he's just a young guy that's thrown into a, a, or extraordinary circumstances, like a lot of protagonists in movies. It feels like a film noir kind of genre piece or like a mini narrative inside of this film. So it's a narrative inside of a narrative. Patricia Arquette here is the ultimate object of desire. She is the, the classic blonde uh, fantasy. But even in the fantasy, as I said, she becomes even more elusive and more duplicitous than she is even in the, uh, the, the real part of the story, or at least as, as far as we know. She has him wrapped around her finger at this point and just kind of the, the swell of the music and everything. It's a very intoxicating sequence, but I think what is so great about it is how he keeps saying, um, while it's happening, he, he keeps saying, I want you, I want you. And of course, to maybe a literal minded viewer, they might think, well, I don't understand. I mean, you do have her, you literally are having her at this moment, what else could you want? But to me, I, I kind of find that line really devastating because it sort of illustrates just how different sex and, and love and uh, fulfillment can really be. And that is what makes sex so dangerous. Sex is not love. And yeah, of course the two can go hand in hand, but you cannot confuse the two, and here obviously he has confused that. He is wanting more than what he already has through this kind of fleeting desire of, of sex. He wants that kind of, that spiritual oneness, and yet he can't get it. And when she says, after he says, I want you, and she says, you will never have me, uh, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because of how many people feel the need to project their identities onto the person that they want so badly. And so when she says that, you'll never have me, and she gets up and walks away, it, it leaves him in complete disarray and he can no longer escape his pain. So that is when Pete turns back into Fred. And it's that idea that resonates with me and why I tend to return a lot of times to David Litch films over the years and why they, they continue to mean a lot to me. It's because of how he is exploring that deep pain and that inability to find your personal truth in your fantasy and that fantasy is such a destructive device. Falling for what we desire, of course, is a very hypnotic thing and we're all human. So naturally we have those flaws where we want to give into that. And of course, Lynch also falls for a, a lot of that romanticism, particularly the romanticism of filmmaking. I think if he didn't, he wouldn't be nearly as compelling as, as an artist. But I will say, I, 
like I said at the beginning of this review, I do respect uh, David Lynch for going into more uh, avant-garde, more experimental territory. And I do think that he achieves it in a, in a lot of interesting, very alluring ways in this particular film. But ultimately, these characters and these ideas, I don't think that they're broken in nearly enough. They feel like a lot of sort of empty archetypes that are um, standing in place for certain purposes so that they can be de deconstructed in the narrative rather than truly resonating as something powerful for us. There's something that's slightly removed and, and cold about it. And to me, like I mentioned, when you compare the two, when you compare this to Mulholland Drive, that film is the one that is far more fully realized because it's it's more authentic and it's exploring the psyche of the protagonist in a way that to me is just more fleshed out. There is a real pain and a real melancholy emptiness that is at the center of Mulholland Drive where you feel the motivations of the characters a lot more and they're explored more. And I think that that's what, that's a movie that David Lynch had been working towards his whole career and little by little he was getting there. And Lost Highway is, is him testing those waters. Another attempt that doesn't quite come to fruition but I feel like he had to make Lost Highway before he could make a movie like Mulholland Drive. And so because of that, yeah, I'm grateful that Lost Highway was made. So in that sense, yeah, absolutely. I think that this movie is worth your time, especially if you are really a, a cinephile and somebody who's a fan of those kind of surrealistic movies, David Lynch type films. And yeah, that's my review. Thank you all for listening. All my social media information's below. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.